Welcome everyone. I'm Stephanie Sandler and Sandra Nadoff and I are thrilled to welcome you to our Rethinking Translation seminar with Tracy K. Smith, who will talk about her translations of the Chinese poet Yi Lei. And she will be introduced by Alex Braslavsky. So my only task is really just to briefly introduce Alex. We are thrilled to welcome her to our Rethinking Translation team. She is going to work with us as our graduate student assistant. And it's really because of Alex that we have this event today. She's studying with Tracy. This was her idea. And we're thrilled that it is happening. Alex Braslavsky is a second year graduate student in the Slavic department here at Harvard. She works in Polish and Czech and even a little bit of Russian literature, writes wonderfully about poetry and is a translator. Her translations of Zuzana Ginchanka are coming out next year. And um, she is a, a, a bright spirit, a, a wonderful presence in our department. So I'm thrilled that she's joining us in this team. I wanna say one last thing, just because I know we're all um, very aware of what's going on in our world. And for those of us who work in the Slavic field, but really for everyone, I think the horror of Ukraine cannot really leave our minds. It makes me think about why we do what we do, why we have events like this, why we teach, um, but it all the more so makes me grateful that there is poetry that we can turn to. And it feels quite fortuitous, even though our subject is not Ukraine today, it feels quite fortuitous that our speaker is Tracy K. Smith, who has spoken uh, to injustice and to history and even to war in her very powerful poetry. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about her work as a translator too. So Alex, take it away. Thanks, Professor. Um, yeah, before we begin, I, as a PhD student in the Slavic department, I want to request that we keep Ukraine in our thoughts and just say that translation is a powerful political tool. And I feel very strongly that translating texts from Ukraine and including more Ukrainian texts on our syllabi will be important for our field. Um, and I'm definitely aiming I would love to work with Professor Sandler and Nadoff this semester to, and to host a Ostap Keen, perhaps a translator of Ukrainian poetry. So please join our listserv if you are interested in following our seminar. Okay, well, it's an honor to uh, introduce Professor Smith. Uh, during the pandemic, one of my rituals was to listen to Tracy K. Smith's podcast, The Slowdown. In five minute long recordings, she would reflect on the joyful chaos of raising her children or bringing in a memory of finishing school or wearing a great outfit. And then she would follow up with a reading of a poem she was thinking about. And I would lie on the ground, kick my feet up onto the wall and listen intently to these healing recordings, knowing that they were healing for a lot of people and that we were all invisibly flanking each other in our listening. And I still listen to the podcast. It's now hosted by Ada Limon and it's really beautiful. And um, in case people are interested, I'll post a link in the chat a little bit later. But um, in terms of her poetry, uh, Tracy, hold on, I'm having a bit of a malfunction. There we go. Okay. Professor Smith um, speaks truth to power and grieves at the passing of her parents and hurdles the rippling of future history. I often think of the late Svetlana Boehm's book, Future Nostalgia, when reading her work. And I have been able to turn to her work at so many instances, most recently mailing a copy of her collection Life on Mars to a friend who's grieving the loss of his father right now. There's a surface tension in Professor Smith's poetic that is stilled, tender, and light, but with a vastness just underneath it that belies her lines compression. Um, as in one of my favorite poems of hers entitled The Wave After Wave is one wave never tiring. 
published around the same time that her translations of Yi Lei were in 2020. A brief quote from that poem. The smallest waves strangle in, are tugged back to surge, to rise, to be swallowed and remain. They are wet in the sand, spreading in and down, dark center of the old stain. The wave after wave is one wave never tiring. I often think of translation as a confluence of waves. Translation throws into high relief the fact that literature, especially poetry, goes beyond any single author. At a translation event at BU last month, Professor Smith mentioned that in order to write her versions of Yile's poetry, um, quote, I came out of myself and Yile came out of herself a little bit. Um, Yile's passing in 2018 also in effect represented what I see as a powerful line break in Smith's translation process as Smith had the experience of translating the living Yi Lei and also the late Yi Lei. Uh, Professor Smith also holds that she's not a translator, but rather, quote, I'm a fan of Yi Lei's work and I'm a guest of her imagination. Through their joint writing process, Tracy K. Smith and Yi Lei create a gorgeous hybrid poetic together. Let's please give her a well, warm welcome. Oh, thank you so much. What a lovely and thoughtful introduction. Um, I like to think about translation as, as something like a wave or a series of waves, um, which is often useful to my hope in terms of what I'm doing when I'm writing a poem. Like I'm hoping that I can be intercepted by some other imagination um, human or other um, that might help in, in whatever I'm wrestling with. And for me, a poem often comes from a site of unrest. And so, you know, I, I hold that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guest in the genre of translation, um, but maybe that's the goal in many ways to enter into a space where we can be met by someone else, made to feel more um, at home in ourselves and in the, the imaginative space where we're seeking access to. So I, I like that you framed it like that. I feel a little bit more um, sure of why I'm here now. <laughs> um, I, I'll tell you a little bit about just my relationship to Elay's work. Um, Elay was a poet who became quite famous quite quickly in the um, late 80s, mid to late 80s in China. Um, and she was a participant in a, a famous like poetry workshop at Peking University. Um, she became more widely known and debated when she published a poem called A Single Woman's Bedroom, which um, sort of um, moved into space that had long been taboo, thinking about female sexuality, thinking about you know, lovers deciding to live together or not. Um, was something that was um, not only frowned upon, but illegal um, in that time period. But I think the work was so powerful because it spoke to a reality, it brought language to something that had been subterranean for many people. Um, but she also was really insistent um, upon the relationship of her work, even in thinking about love to questions of freedom. And it makes sense to me to imagine that love gives us access to um, a self that wishes to be free, you know, in the private, in the body even. But of course, her imagination was so fierce and so um, willing to connect that that freedom became something that, that crossed the line between self and other and, and had um, bearing upon the collective, on the, the, the national, the political, um, what I love is that the vocabulary doesn't necessarily change across those lines. She's holding herself to uh, a standard in each one of these contexts that really spoke to me as a poet. Um, I met Elay um, through the poet who became my Chinese translator, Yuang Yang Wang. 
Um, and he said, this wonderful poet is coming to New York and she hopes to meet you. And I hope that you will sit down with her. And um, with the help of a friend of Elay's who, you know, was bilingual, the three of us had lunch. Um, and I was given a copy of, of that, that poem, A Single Woman's Bedroom. And I've written, you know, I feel like I'm quoting myself a little bit, but it's really true. Um, in reading that poem, I found a version of myself or the self that I, I have often wished to be. I felt a kinship even in the way that her imagination um, built this large, sprawling, ambition, ambitious poem over many sections. It's a serial um, gesture. And that has, in my own work, been a, a mode that has allowed me to take on material that otherwise feels a little bit too big for me to handle. Um, I imagine that I can approach it by parts and trust that even what doesn't find its way into language might be felt. Um, you know, maybe something along the lines of Keats's negative capability. Um, that's alive in Elay's work. She's also a poet whose imagination and whose interest was international. Whitman is one of her, um, you know, the an literary ancestors that she claims. There is a, a movement in, in uh, one of her sequential poems that is thinking about biblical terminology, the language of Christianity, um, and um, because there is there is so much transformation that happens um, in my work on her poems, someone you know was wondering, is that something you brought in? Is that in one of what you're referring to when you sometimes say that you brought in different image systems to try and um, offer support for these poems in the context of the American imagination? But no, that's not one. <laughs> Somebody who grew up in um, China, she was aware of. I guess the Bible is a literary text and um, interested in, in what um, that might do to help frame some of her own questions and seeking, even as relates to love. Um, I worked, and maybe this is the last thing I'll say for a moment, and then I'll read some of the poems so you can hear what our, our voices sound like together, and maybe that will generate some observations and questions. I hope it will. Um, but I worked with a co-translator um, who is named Chang Tai Bi. He goes by the name David. He's a longtime friend of Elay, kind of like a nephew um, to her. And he's also a teacher of English. And so he um, translated in literal fashion her selected poems and was the kind of gateway that we each had to pass through in order to speak to one another. I took those initial translations and worked on them until I felt that they were poems alive in living contemporary English. And I gave them back to him and I said, okay, now translate this back literally so Elay can see the distance her poem has been made to travel. And so he was really doing what I think of as the heavy lifting in that dynamic. Um, and he helped me to understand her responses to, to that work. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll start by reading a few poems and I can um, pause every now and then and see if there are things that you wanna talk about. Um, this is the first poem in the, in the collection. Um, the collection is called My Name Will Grow Wide Like a Tree. Um, but there's a, I guess there are a lot of different consciences that I'm interested in in Elay's work. This sort of sense of the self as this varied, um, holy, um, large and contradiction riddled entity that's also perfectly intact is, is one region of her commitment. But she's also really committed to the earth. Um, there's an eco poetics that runs through her work in some ways because thinking about nature, it helps her to understand more fully the interior of, of the human. Um, and this is one poem that I think offers that kind of um, flexibility or generosity. Green trees greet the rainstorm. I belong to the nation of wild arms flailing in wind. And I know you are bound to unravel me, but how can I not lift my head and look you in the eye? How can I fail to greet you, though my living gown will soon be battered to threads? 
better this lashing, flesh burst open, ransacked by air, than to live ambushed by loneliness. I belong to the nation of startled cries, voices flailing in wind. And I know you are bound to unravel me, but how can I not lift my head and look you in the eye? How can I fail to greet you, though my living gown will soon be shredded, shed? Better to be ravaged straight away in youth than to live out another year's quiet, undoing. Um, the title of this poem is pretty much a literal uh, translation of what, what it, it is in, um, in the original. And what I love about the poem and is that it offers a metaphor, either a metaphor for which to think about the struggle and the wish, the desire to connect, the willingness to be vulnerable um, of the speaker in, you know, human dynamics in national dynamics, um, or a poem that endows nature, you know, with its vulnerabilities, with um, a sense of, of, of such stakes, you know, in, in the face of perhaps the weather or in the face of the human, which I think is just really like a powerful traffic of perspectives. Um, running through the work. Um, I'll read another um, and then maybe um, furtive. A squall, sorry, a black squall blankets the earth. The stubborn are drenched, worn down. Even dreams are slick and choked with moss. Is meeting out of habit any worse than coming clean? I can't let go of this clipping lifted from your wife's garden. Time and again, my voice storms up in a rage, weeps back down in tatters. Such secrecy unravels me. Still, my heart harbors a furtive joy. Why must I whisper? I've been careless with your letters, which lie scattered, lost. My name for you creeps off like a plant that has overgrown its pot. And this is a poem that goes back and forth across that line. Um, I think, you know, in this book, it sits close to the poems that begin to think about the, the conflict itself that, you know, one becomes in love in the complexities of, of um, relationships. Um, but I love that it begins and kind of cleaves to this sense of, of the natural world as a site for making sense of, of that feeling. Um, there's, um, there's something really beautiful about, I, I think, I know I mentioned this in the introduction to the book, but there are a lot of poems in her work that are thinking about love, about the complications and the betrayals and the secrecy. This poem, um, I remember sitting with Elay and David over dinner one night in Beijing and, and being told, okay, there's an affair in, in the, you know, the backstory to many of these poems. Um, and, you know, David kind of spelled it out for me and maybe the next poem I read will be a single woman's bedroom because I think that that speaker is implicated in this, but, um, Elay, you know, let him tell me the story of that, of that relationship. And he, you know, told her what, what he had said. And then she, her answer was love is innocent. Um, and I feel like there's something so large about the willingness, what I read of, you know, a person to forgive their young self, to give credit to something real, even in the face of something that's fraught. And um, I don't know, there are lots of occasions when I was with Elay where some small gesture like that reminded me that her poetic imagination isn't confined to the work on the page, but it's a way of looking, it's a philosophy of being. Um, and that, that feels like such a, an ongoing gift um, and maybe that's one of the reasons, Alex, why I, I keep wanting to say this is a, this book is a project that emerges out of a devotion to this, this 
uh, voice and, and the, the imagination that it, that it gives shape to, um, because I feel like such a, you know, I feel so fortunate to have learned. I was, um, I had been working on my memoir for about five or six years. Um, and I, it had been uh, about four years since uh, Life on Mars was published. And that was a book that kind of changed my life in a lot of ways. And so I had a lot of um, anxiety. I wasn't writing poems. I had been working for a long time in a genre that um, was new to me, that I was learning my way in. I was nervous to start writing poems again because I didn't, how could my next book win a Pulitzer Prize? And so therefore, what was I gonna do? Um, how could I justify that somehow? And the invitation to think my way back into poetry by way of another poet's imagination and another poet's commitment to language and, and her own uh, questions was so helpful. It felt like it was life-saving to me. Um, it led me back into myself in a way, gave me, um, I think, some tools or capacities as a poet that helped me, you know, eventually um, begin writing again. Um, so maybe I'll read a couple of poems if you'll kind of like indulge me of my own that speak back to this. Um, but let me go first to um, a couple of sections from a, a sequence, a suite called Love's Dance. Um, and I think this is about the lifespan of, of a relationship. It begins, uh, with the section one, which is called, It Was a Bewitching. Uh, at least that's the English version. It was a bewitching, your open hand, motionless, mute, but resolute, commanding. Of course I followed, past lights first dim, then sordid, bright as a marquee of the underworld. Your animal heat, heart in full gallop. I gripped you with my heels, fingers knotted into your hair. I saw my blue coat transformed into a dune colored cape. Day and night, that urge and charge. Then I got down and accepted the bit. I, for whom solitude was as vast as the prairie. Loving you shed light on the catastrophes of history. Still, certain questions continue to saddle me. Maybe this section is an example of, of image systems that helped me um, to bring a poem over. You know, it's hard to, and I know you know this because you're working in translation. I found it hard, especially as somebody who wasn't, didn't have access to the original, to, um, dutifully carry over all the complications of narrative um, from one version to an, the next. Um, there's a, a line in the original that becomes dune colored, but it's a geographical reference that it felt impossible for me to unpack and then kind of swerve away from. Um, but looking around at the landscape that took shape in many of the poems and thinking about some of the verbs that might have lived, you know, in a way in the original helped me to find um, scaffolding. And so for this poem, it, you know, it's almost that sense of the gallop, the animal world imagery that comes in. It's bolstered by the sense of the landscape of the dunes that kind of gave me the sense of, of someone riding, riding a horse. And that carries um, the last half of the poem forward. That's an introduced system, but I felt like it also captured the sense of, um, you know, almost like erotic momentum that lives in the sense of, you know, desire that the poem is, is naming. Um, and the final couple of lines allowed the inversion, you know, of power to come across. Um, and that, that was kind of, um, that thinking in some ways helped me to understand what was happening for me as I read Elay's poems, but it also gave me an approach to describing feeling that became useful to me, I think, or is useful to me in thinking about my work. How can the prevailing um, 
almost like a background metaphor become a vehicle for thinking about the feeling um, that's on the surface of the poem or the narrative that's on the surface of the poem. Um, this is another section that has a similar kind of behavior. So that was section one. This is section nine of the same long poem. It's the subtitle is I fight with myself. I am on my way, on my way to you, striding the earth, it seems, the tundra between us, though I am nearing you now, nearing the tropics of your chest, that island around which the water rolls and swells. Time gapes wide like a cavern. I fight with myself, am yanked back. You villain touch, what are you doing? I was so angry once, a bay of hostility. What if I stop now and let myself be lapped against like a barrier of rocks? Not the sharp edged gnarled ones that wink out beyond the borders of safety, but the gentle ones that sleep here chastely in a little heap. And maybe for this poem, I'll, I'll end with the, that Christianity section I was talking about earlier. Um, I think that the, you know, I mean, it's almost like opera when you think about the terms of, of um, especially like the King James Bible, the terms of Christianity. And I think that Ely seizes that dramatic um, scope in this in this section, and I tried to kind of be obedient to that as as strictly as I could, uncrowned, incorruptible. God strikes his holy bells, Ave Maria, and your hand grabs mine. We, the uncrowned righteous, the uncrowned incorruptible, mute of vows and ignorant of commandments. Our practiced restraint has earned us what? How many Sundays lived in vain? There are laws and there is law. There is love and there is love. Need and a nagging small want. I would be happy to forsake everything they told me to desire. Glory, rejoicing, even death. To be left with only a limitless holy blank. And you? Do you remember our Old Testament phase, quaking at the fate of whole cities abruptly erased. Now we're on to Jesus, those feet, those wrists. Though belief is a country that eludes us. For ceremony, we light a mosquito coil, turn down the bed, whisper about small things like mornings on the beach, swimming farther and farther into cold rhythmic waves almost eager for the greedy underside of day. God is ravenous, unending fright. Blessed Virgin, safe on the shore or high up on the cliff overlooking every sea, forget me. I love the way that uh, belief system becomes a foreign country in that poem. Um, and I love the terms of you know, knowledge, courage um, that, that get connected to God. Um, maybe I'll read one brief poem of hers and then one of mine, just to give you a sense of some of the, the informing that her work has done. Um, and it's a really, oh, actually, this is a really small one. Um, it's, Sorry, I'm looking for it. Post perpetual. There are, you know, so Ile has a lot of these sweeping epic feeling poems, epic in their, their wish or will, and then some very compact ones. Like here's a, this poem, it almost feels like a, a um, thought experiment. And, um, you know, I, saw this in the bundle of poems that I had for a long time. And it was after her death that um, I returned to it 
and it felt like a, one of many codas, you know, poignant codas. Um, so post perpetual. When life ends, memory endures. When memory ends, what persists attests to the spirit. So it's, um, you know, this elegant little gesture, two sentences. Um, the title helps to frame it in, in terms of the, the sort of, um, what I think of as like the cosmic scope of its, its questioning. Um, let me see if I can find poems. Um, and then I'd love to have a conversation with you. Um, there's a lot that, you know, there's a poem that I, I wrote after that first trip to China um, that is for Elay. Um, but there's, there's another tiny poem in here that feels like it comes from working in, in that poem and others that are similar, that are just one thought folding, folding in, in another direction. Um, I'm really bad with titles. Sometimes I don't even remember my own titles. That's why it's taking me um, a minute to find this poem. Um, Oh, I feel most unprepared looking at my own work. I'm so sorry. Um, I know it's in this book. The everlasting self, sorry about that. The everlasting self comes in from a downpour, shaking water in every direction, a collaborative condition gathered, shed, spread, then forgotten, reabsorbed, like love from a lifetime ago, and mud a dog has tracked across the floor. So um, there's a, what it may be, I wanna call something like an aperture of just kind of investigation. That, that her work houses so powerfully and moving through it in her vocabulary um, in that one poem and, and others kind of opened up that space in my own vocabulary as well. So um, I wonder if you have like thoughts or questions that we can talk together about. I, I'm, I'm just gonna jump, jump in here. I have a million things going through my head, but first of all, I wanna just thank you for, um, for the poetry you just read and, 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 and your reflections on it. That was so, so moving and powerful. I, I'm really struck by the phrase um, that I believe you use that you were a guest of her imagination. And, and that started me thinking about what the responsibilities of a guest are um, but also what the responsibilities of a host are. And I, I, I wonder, this is very vague, but I, and I don't want to reduce it to, um, you know, were there times when you didn't, you know, the host wasn't welcoming of the guest or the guest resisted the host or whatever. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what that guest host relationship was like and how you negotiated it and whether there were moments of tension, friction, disagreement, um, instead of the incredible opening and love, frankly, that there seemed to be in that relationship? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, well, one thing I'll have to say is, you know, there was, there was a translator. And so I received everything uh, from Ile through David in a spirit of kind of like, excitement and gratitude this you're doing this work in my work and i'm grateful i want you to think about these things again and so i trust that i felt that when we were in physical space together but perhaps i'm you know projecting um 
I like the way you asked the question, what does a good guest do and what does a good host do? Um, when I think about it now, I understand the scope of how, you know, the, the goodness of, of Elay as a host. She allowed me to come into her poems with certain, you know, acknowledging there are certain things I wasn't gonna be able to recognize or appreciate, like the sound of her poems, the, the rhyme, you know, I, I received them. I didn't have her with me all the time. I could hear her read her work, but even so my ear isn't really trained to hear the nuance of, of Mandarin um, and to do something with that. So she forgave that. Um, and in that space that was cleared because I wasn't gonna be able to go there, she also said, well, in that space, it's okay for you to try and do something that will make this work feel indigenous, let's say, for an American reader. So the lotuses, you know, there are a lot of jasmines and winter jasmines, and there are fewer in the book. The ones that are in the book, I think, are literal, um, you know, in terms of the plant realm. Um, there's a lotus that, that isn't here that got replaced by a soul um, because I didn't want the, you know, exoticization that so many of us have been, you know, trained in even unwittingly or unwillingly to kind of mess up that listening that a reader might do. Um, nevertheless, there's also a lot of me that got in like, okay, if I was a guest, I came to understand in doing the final revisions of this book that I left a lot of dishes on the sink. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of me a lot of my excitement at being in this world that I sought eventually to pull back um, flourishes that felt like they were not essential, but it was me having fun in this new place. And she didn't challenge that, but there was something about her commitment to certain things. Um, for example, in um, my trend for initial draft of um, a single woman's bedroom, I was fixated on love, you know, between people um, as the driving theme. And she said, yeah, yeah, you've got that. That's there, but it goes away. It gets sublimated to conscience and independence and a will to stand up even against uh, authority. That has to be in my poem. And so she sent me back home to, to try and bring that out. Um, the other things that got changed, I think they were changed with the reality that this is an elegiac work, you know, and, and working to um, honor her even more than I believed. It sounds awful to say than I believed was necessary initially because it felt like we were doing something together, you know? Um, so I sought to, you know, I, speaking of Christianity, I grew up going to church and I remember being a kid and struggling with this verse. I don't know where in the Bible it comes from, but he must increase, I must decrease. And I hated that because I was like, I want to live my life and feast on the world. I don't like this idea that I have to make space for something holy. Um, but that's the phrase that kept coming into my head when, um, after Eli died, she's got to increase in this work. And my exuberance or my appetite has got to get toned down. And so I, I sought to pull back. Thank you so much. Hi, Rita. You're so, still muted though, I can't hear you yet. I seem to be trying to unmute everybody else, which didn't work. <laughs> I just want to, you know, I'm not a steady visitor to this seminar, but I was delighted by the beauty of these poems and the way you made them both yours and uh, Eli's. And one of the things that struck me throughout the poems, and you talk about language systems, but what I noticed, and perhaps what one of the things, I don't know if this was implicit in what she was saying to you as well, was that the, the poems about the affair are quite full of power. It's the power of love, but also the literal power of a man, you know, uh, the, this idea of being both the writer and the ridden in that poem that you talked about that had the blue coat that turned to a dune color. And I think, I wonder if, if, if it's unique to her or if it's also a Chinese problem, perhaps similar to what we're seeing now in the former Soviet Union. I, I hate to use even that phrase, where individual life is so much subsumed under the restrictions of an authoritarian regime 
And it seems to me this comes out in almost every poem you read, mm -hmm. though you didn't cite it particularly as an influence. And I wonder if you could say more, uh, more about that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that that's part of what she was trying to urge me to see. You see bodies in this poem, and so you see desire, but you need to see struggle and domination and the desire to counter that. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of images of the male body. There's a, um, a poem that describes weather um, as an assault from a male figure, you know, and in my version, it's rain hacks at the earth like an insatiable man. Um, and so that dynamic comes in and um, that sensibility isn't far. I mean, I think it's even in the same, here, let me read it. Well, no. Uh, the sense of like the community, space, city. So there's a barricade, a storm barricading the roads and sandbags, and somehow um, the architecture of, of of or the ge geography of of a city begins to make me aware of you know the collective. Um, yeah, yeah, that speaks a little bit to your what you're observing. Maybe there's um maybe I'll I'll um the poem that feels most directly um addressing nationhood conflict uh is is a poem called Red Wall. Um and I'll read it and then talk a little bit about it. In the original, I'll show you uh, if I can find it quickly. Um, there's a like a physical form that the poem takes on that I can't, couldn't replicate um, in English. Um, sorry. And in those columns are um, basically adjectives, um, states, and, and um, their opposites. Um, and so it's a poem that's thinking in, in other terms about that, that power dynamic. Um, Red Wall, and this is written in 1987, October 31st, 1987. Hot, and I think that's why dates exist. Uh, I mean, that's not why all the poems are dated, but it becomes really useful in China, um, I understood where there's a, still a great deal of discretion around discussing, you know, Tiananmen Square to just say it, this was written in 1987. Um, and so there are a lot of dates. Um, in fact, I was with her and she held up a newspaper. I think I might have a, um, oh, I'm not gonna be able to put my hands on a copy. Oh, I'm in my office. I should have prepared a little better, um, called the Poetry Newspaper, that um, she and some peers who were writers and editors created. And we read together and she held it up and she said, this is back, we, we've done this issue. Um, this went out of print in 1987, I need not say more. Um, and so there's a way that, you know, this lived experience is invoked. Redwall hot, having burned me, but also warmed me. I regard it from a distance, the flowers choking it, bleeding onto it, red legacy binding our generations. From below, we thousands cast upon it a beatific, benighted, complacent, complicit, decorous, disconsolate, distracted, expectant, execrative, filthy, grievous, guileless, hallowed, hot-headed, hungry, incredulous, indifferent, inscrutable, insubordinate, joyful, loath, mild, peace-loving, profane, proud, rageful, rancorous, rapt, skeptical, terrified, tranquil, unperturbed, unrepentant, warring, I.
I feel so grateful in some ways being able to step into her sense of um, self in nation and the the conflict that that that, that um, trips. Um, you know, I worked on this poem and many of these poems during the Trump administration. Um, I didn't take that to give me qualms about, you know, Nate, my, my role as a citizen of, of the US, but this poem um, in its just directness and its unrelentingness and that listing and all the, the turns and um, the way one, one feeling undercuts the other but doesn't erase it, that felt like a helpful mantra to kind of step into. Um, her poem, I showed you the columns and so the form that I applied to this, which just looks like looks like a sonnet, really, um, was just to alphabetize those terms or or adjacent near near to to the original terms, so that I felt myself um, stuck in something that um, moved of its own volition in some way. You know, just the movement through the alphabet. Um, Tracy, there's a question for you in the chat. Um, does this experience make you want to translate anyone else or other work? There are a lot of Elay poems that I haven't translated and there's a part of me that feels like I, I should, I want to be able to. Some of the ones that I found most difficult were the ones that I didn't get to complete and include in this book. Um, but I, I do feel that the living dynamic of one poet and another poet was so essential to my even being courageous enough to, you know, do something like this to translate. Um, and so I imagine it would, it, it might hinge upon something like that for me in the future. You know, um, there was a time when I was seeking to translate um, a poet, a Mexican poet, um, it was a time when Mexico was a big part of my life and Spanish was much more, um, you know, I was more fluent in Spanish than I am now. I don't feel that my relationship to a particular language is powerful enough to warrant me going out and finding a poet to translate, but I could imagine that um, friendship or love, you know, which really is what I think of this friendship as embodying would be a good motivator. Can I get you to go back to Red Wall, which I'm just completely captured by? It's all captivating. It's amazing work, but it's so striking to um, think about just the the syntax, the the fracturing of the language. And you know, you could put in a thimble what I know about the Chinese language, but I what I do understand is that it doesn't work with verb tense. Um, and with the kind of um, subject, verb, object, syntax that um, Indo-European languages work with, that a, a, the, a lot is built into um, the, the, the word for a word, and especially temporally. And so um, it, it's a roundabout way of asking because you, you've spoken so movingly about the way your own poetry was impact, it had was affected almost from the inside in terms of the process of how the poem gets made. And I wondered if any of that fracturing of language also pushed your poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is just so powerful to see that list of adjectives and, um, you know, it, it has almost like every one of those words has the force of a sentence. Um, I love that question. Um, I think that there is, I, I want to say yes, in a way. I want to say that, um, but I'll be honest and say that it is the way that something like that fracturing, which to me is an, a component of something getting enlarged, um, is an extension of, of theme or feeling. Um, and there are large questions 
there's a, a ambition to be both in the self and the body, but aligned with something big and beyond in this work. And, you know, that speaks to my imagination. It speaks to this love that I have of what, what I perceive as being the mysterious or the cosmic. Um, the newest poems that I've written um, are different syntactically than the poems that live in my other books. Um, part of that has to do with that seeking and part of it has to do with um, that sense of dialogue, literal dialogue with something outside of the self, you know, and um, um, I don't know that I have a good example here, but let's see if I maybe. But it's the sense that when the scope of your questions change, then language accommodates that. Um, and I don't think that it's um, for me ever the other way around. Oh, here's a here's a poem that might might sort of fit the bill. It might illustrate what I'm talking about, but it, it's you know it doesn't extend from the work on Elay, but I think that it embodies some of what might. This is called Logos. Um, this is a poem that is, you know, usually my, my poems employ the same um, punctuation that you see in prose. Um, and there's a logic that lives in the sentence, even as it's hopefully like augmented or disrupted by what happens in, in a line. This is a little different. Logos. Safe in the light along the bank, being in believing, no name only being on the bank, radiant and blank, safe watching and seeing on the brink of the light, blank, no blame in being, waiting then seeing, breathing in being. Let my voice, let my voice on the banks along that brink after the blaze of knowing that singing. You know, it's a poem about language, not logic, but language as a, as a life giving or originating source or force. And so reading it in this context, I wanna hear, oh, it seems like it could live a little while in the question of, of translation. What does it mean? you know, to surrender a certain kind of agency and to seek to embody something that's bigger than what, what fits in discrete languages. Um, I know that's not where that poem comes from, but I like that it enacts a little bit of what I'm kind of hearing in, in some of the, just thinking about the practice of translation. It's a really powerful example of what you were talking about. Thank you for reading it. One of the things I heard in the repetitions was the, a kind of stutter and staying with those phrases, staying with those words that rhymes in a way with the staying with adjectives or saying that's, that's I mean, there's, there's in that Elay, in the original version of Redwall, you all that white space does something, right? You know, something hangs there. If, if it's not in the mortar between those, those massive bricks, um, then it's something resisting that or something else. And maybe there's the, the rupture. You feel something like that in the rupture between, between statements or, or words in, in my poem, I hope. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to hear? Oh, good. Okay, Sophia. Um, I was just also, I'm also sort of a guest in this space. So thank you for including me. Um, and I'm just wondering, you mentioned earlier about scaffolding and um, sort of this bridge between translation and uh, acknowledging misreading things. And I think poetry at times can be um, 
uh, sort of a great way of allowing mis different misreadings to intertwine and create energy. Um, and you spoke of uh, the, the way a Western lens or uh, the lens of an English reader can have on a text and choosing specific words um, and the effects that they can have. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the scaffolding and sort of inviting misreading or, or, the, or that space between, um, what hangs in the space between words um, when you were translating. Because to me, I would never be able to choose a specific word. I would see a problem with every word I chose. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering about that. Mm -hmm. Um, for some reason, um, I think about what happened. So when I go to a poetry reading, um, even if I know the poem very well, there's a moment where I get so excited by a specific image that I wander off, you know, my head kind of follows a thought and I lose, lose my footing in the poem as it's progressing. And then I come back in and we're somewhere and I, you know, that happens a few times in a, in a poem that moves me. Um, there's something adjacent or like sort of like parallel to that, that I experienced um, working in these poems, especially the long ones, um, whereby there would be an image that, or a statement and admission um, that opened up a little window for me. And I could imagine a life, <laughs> I can imagine a whole life in the space that the, the, the poem built. And um, somehow I feel like that is connected to what you're talking about, like the misreadings or the things that will, will be wrong. If they can nevertheless invite you to inhabit the space in a way that feels um, complementary to where the poem might actually be going in the author's hands, that, that feels like some form of consolation. Um, does that make sense? Um, a, a better translator, a more faithful translator would make some choices and find, this is what I imagine, but I'd love to hear from you. It's a really, you can't do that for every feature of the poem. You can't say you're going to get all the images, you're going to get all the music, you're going to get all the associations, and the poem's going to look like the original. It's going to do the same thing on the paper. Like no, no poem can really do that. And so there are these choices that are made. Um, I think I made some choices that allowed a re hopefully allow a reader to go to a place and then come back to the, the place that's relevant um, and that that little experience can um, be useful too, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And, it, and it, it, it's the way you speak of translation very much seems like conversation, which I love. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Hi, Veronica. You're still muted. I feel a bit muted for the past five days. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the for this very beautiful reading. And I just um, also allowed myself in this last hour to just flow with the words and certain words just really stayed with me. One. Um, one of them is you in the first two poems you um you you use the word unravels and and i was um just w wondering even how uh, much you felt that this is your word and how much i would even be interested in the in the original mm -hmm. um, what whether there was a as whether it was the same work or a similar mm -hmm. to this. So that's one little question. The other word that really resonates with me um, is the, the word increase that you use. And that seems to be so powerfully also reflecting on your approach to translation as an, in a way increasing the power um, of the original uh, poetry in in your own in your own way perhaps mm -hmm. and I also if I can allow myself a little bit of association associations uh, years ago in this uh, translation seminar we were studying uh, Paul Celan's uh, 
retranslations of Shakespeare into German. So this kind of reverse effect. And you also mentioned that you uh, worked um, through retranslation, uh, that the second stage of your, <clears throat> of your work was, as far as I understood it, was, um, unless I misunderstand, misunderstood you, was there a stage where your English translation was translated back to Mandarin mm -hmm. and whether you could talk to that? So I'm sorry really all over the place today. Well, I, 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 you know, that's where trust came in for me, that David was doing as faithful to both sides, you know, so he back translated so that she could see kind of like the map of what my poem did and how compare that to hers. Um, but there was a lot of faith. <laughs> we both, you know, involved every step of the way. Um, there were moments I encountered the original translation where David, I couldn't understand something that it didn't, you know, the English was never like flawlessly smooth or natural because of what it was seeking to do. But there were some moments where I was just so stopped by a word that wasn't really a word. And, um, and so I used, I tried to see what was continuous what what the thread that I could define where it went and I sought to go to that place sometimes and so then I would give it back to him and he I would say I didn't know what you were saying here this is what I did he would show it to Elay and what I did kind of lined up with what she had done because of the integrity of her work not so much my intelligence or something um, but there was this sense that he, he had to come clean a little bit at those moments and say, oh, okay, well, that was where I put in a little flourish of my own. I couldn't resist making this sound good to me. And so he, he had to kind of remember not to do that. Um, but the other thing, um, yeah, because we were all working in service of, of this one imagination, really. But I, I want to look because I have the document. I just want to see if Unravels is where that began and I'll just see if I can do it quickly and if, if not um if not not I, I worked from this um pdf um no so this is crumbled into dust. Green leaves are crumbled into dust is what I got um, from him. And so I, it's almost the reverse. It becomes something intact that's undone as opposed to, um, yeah, that was, that was me. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny to, it's, it's interesting to go back through. I, I haven't done it a whole lot, but before the the other talk that Alex mentioned, I was looking through, you know, original, the, or I can't see the original, I can't read the original. So this intermediary to me and seeing where, um, there are moments where I felt I can't say, that can't, I can't say that in a poem. And so I'm gonna have to replace that altogether. And that's where certain things happened. Um, green leaves crumbled into dust felt like something I couldn't say in a poem. Um, and so there was something else that I looked for. And the right before that, it's the leaves are described as like these, this body covering. And so that's where I started thinking of the garment and the gown and then thread came into my head and this undoing. And so that was the kind of path that my, my imagination took for almost every word in a way. How can I, how can I see this, something in this that helps me land on um, a network of, of terms? Thank you. Um. There are a couple of poems that were so helpful to me. Um, one of them is a poem for Ely's mother. Um, maybe 
I, I'd love to read it if that's okay. So her mother, this is written in 2002, an elegy for her mother. And I've written, elegy is a big, such a big part of my poetic practice because I've lost both my parents and I need them. And so writing a poem is a way of invoking them, speaking to them, remembering them more fully. And so this, this poem just was a gift to be able to work in. Mother, mother, you lounge on a cloud surrounded by God in his absence. Mother, I dream you are always returning. I wake and wait for your steps in the hall. Mother, mornings I hear you puttering. At night you mutter and hum over the laundry. The earth is still warm from you. I see your needlework and the grasses that sway. When you were alive, I worried your hair gray. You cried like a little girl wanting her way. Mother, losing you, my life has grown brittle. The air has lost all its give. Nothing surrounds me. My hands have never been so greedy for the warmth of your body or my eyes more restless, scouring the crowd for your face in the sea. God is real. The earth perceives us. Ghosts roam among the living, bargaining for an hour as flesh. Mother, you are a green leaf swept from the tree by unseasonable winds to wander the heavens like a star. I pray for a day each year when we might collide. In still water, I search for your eyes. Mother, how could you have lived once and not forever? How have we not gone everywhere together? Mother, I see you on your cloud a shadow above this impossible city. I hurl my voice at the sky, mother. And what answers back is the absence of everything that isn't you. Awesome. A way that it almost feels like we can minister to one another and, and kind of listening and That feels like an amazing poem to end on maybe. Alex, I don't know if you had any last words or thoughts you wanted to offer. No? No. Thank you. Um, yes, on, only then to end with, with gratitude um, for for your amazing translations and for your for the generosity of spirit in sharing with us so much about your own practice um, as a translator, but also as a poet and sharing these beautiful poems. Um, these are these are difficult days, and I like as Veronica said, I I feel incredibly grateful to have had this respite. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I feel like I've always felt that poems teach us to listen better, you know, and with more humility and attention than every other thing in our life encourages us to do. And so, yeah, it feels important to remember that we can do that in the world as well, not just with texts, you know. Yes, so. indeed, indeed. Well, thank you again, and, and thank you all for, for coming. Um,